This is Angela Burns, and gaming looks good. Back to the lab with the mic, mic, back, back. What you looking for the same thing? Walk up the beat with the mic on the sofa. Back on the scene to pull the lesson out. That's right, y'all. We back on the scene to pull the lesson out. This is Gaming Looks Good, episode number 13, and we are covering the game Sunset. Um, now, this is the show where we take one game and we look at it from the lens of diversity. So that's race, gender, sexuality, um, all different kinds of uh, issues that uh, come up in this hobby that we love. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we are joined um, by the actual voice actor that played the voice of the main character in Sunset um, named Angela Burns. Um, that is Tina Marie Murray. Um, and as you heard, she did a nice little drop intro for the show. Very, very excited about that. Awesome. Um, some other new stuff is you might notice right on top of me, the Spawn on Me logo. Um, that is the podcast um, by Khalif Adams and Cicero Holmes that focuses on people of color um, in the gaming industry um, and the broader um, gaming universe. Um, we are now affiliated with that podcast. So now the gaming looks good. Um, the video series, we will be doing video drops on their podcast, and now we have their logo on ours. So, uh, just some, just kind of sharing the love there, you know, just making sure that, um, we all stick together and make some dope stuff together. Um, and also the t-shirt of the week is another I Need Diverse Games t-shirt. Look at this. It's pretty awesome. Um, if you go to I Need Diverse Games or contact um cipher of tear on a twitter that is tie that is tying in the past you can probably get your hands on one of these awesome shirts um she basically had a uh fundraiser she's looking to go um sponsor some uh video game conferences such as AlterConf in uh, chicago um and uh and also to to um fund um get getting some new hardware to run those uh, pc games um, so definitely check out Tanya. We're huge fans of her work. Um, all right. So so before we get into the interview with uh, Tina, I just wanted to um, play some clips from this game just to let you know what it's about. So let's jump right in. Um, this is basically a game about um, you are a housemaid um, in a uh, fictional Latin country called Anchuria. Um, and you're basically a um, housemaid for... Um, a, a mysterious guy named uh, Gabriel or Ortega, and there's a revolution happening in this country, and you come to slowly find out how Gabriel is involved with that and if you should get involved with it or not. It's very awesome. As you can see, there's, there's flames going on, so there is a lot of action, but the cool thing is you're not a part of that action. It, it's all happening outside of you. So, so. You're like the person that's going through the war, but not necessarily like the one hero that solves everything um, that we see in a lot of games, right? So let's go right to the first clip. This is Angela Burns, and gaming looks good. I'm sorry, I, I had to play that again because it is so awesome. All right, now let's go into the clips. <laughs> So um, there are different crates in this building, and um, one way that you interact with a Gabriel is like via notes. So in this one, he left a note saying a crate like this is designed to protect the precious product of humanity. And just says, is there a kid in here or something? Because clearly there's nothing more important than people and humanity and community to Angela. But G Gabriel values more of the materialistic stuff. So like you instantly get kind of a vibe um that they have together um and you know it's it's just really cool how you interact w w with like a person even though you guys are never in the house at the same time because as a housemaid you're normally there to like a clean up after he's doing his business um so let's continue in war optimism is the refuge of fools Somehow Gabrielle still hopes for peace. How can the man be so naive? Life has coddled him. So as you walk in, you immediately see that this place is basically a mansion, right? And Angela is basically like, yo, this dude's like a revolutionary. Life is 
coddling this dude and he believes in you know in a peaceful way um to accomplish this like this like revolution and it's not gonna happen right so like this game takes place in 1972 um which is distinctive because it's the year that angela davis was on trial in the u.s um and you know obviously and angela davis trout traveled the world a lot um and was always a huge critic of the african-american situation in the u.s and angela burns in this game is the same way so she's basically taking her experience as a black woman in, in america who's who who is now you know basically in exile in this other country and is saying yo it just doesn't work like that optimism is the refuge of fools so let's go to the next clip he still thinks there's some way of resolving this through mundane channels. Does he regret what we've done? Will he flee? It must be convenient to come and go as you please, to walk away from the kitchen when it gets hot. Mm, so that's just reemphasizing that, yo, and just like, I'm in this, but Gabriel's just a rich dude that's kind of going in and out and using that class privilege, right, to... Um, Make sure that he's kind of involved, but not as involved as as the people that are really out there in the streets. Um, so I just think that you know, as you can hear, like like the voice acting is phenomenal, as we'll hear again from uh, Tina Marie Murray. Um, but let's continue with some more clips. For a regime like this to come to power, many have to give their support, or at least look the other way. There are rumors that he has the backing of the U.S. It's a worldwide ecosystem. And even here, I can't get away. The cool part about that is it might seem like that music was supposed to come in as she was talking, but it's not. That was that was that was definitely part of the game. I happened to find this record player. I played the record as I was talking. The music just happened to slide in right right when she was talking about it's a worldwide ecosystem. The U.S. is still funding garbage, and she can't get a, a, away from it. And the way that music that it slid in was just so dope. Music is used very, very effectively in this game. Um, usually, it's, it's a lot of like classical or Latin music, and it really accentuates a lot of uh, the themes of um, despair and like loss of like community and the and and the revolution that that you see in the game. Um, so um, so um, yeah, I I just really like that. You know, even though this game is in another country, it never stops to show the imperialistic parts um, of, of like America and its effects on you know all around the globe. Um, so let's go to the next clip. Wow, that was really dope. What drives President Miraflores? He's not stepping down. If I could, I'd face him. I'd scream for everyone we've lost. For all the things that have been turned to ash. I'd burn through him with my screams. How long will this fucking drag on? Mm, so you hear a lot of emotion there. So... President Mita Flores is, is is the um president that basically won from a coup and he's sort of the dictator that uh Gabriel and you know the other rebels, including Andrew's brother David, are trying to topple. So she's just really frustrated. It's like I wanna burn through him with my screams. You can just feel that, you know? Um, and, um, you know, so I think that they, they do a great job, first of all, by like, by like having her properly pronounce these, um, these, um, Latino names, um, like uh, Mita Flores, which is great. Um, and just like delivering that, like impact and that rawness, um, and that rawness continues, um, when she's talking about her, uh, brother David. Moments from the time flash through my head. Riding our bikes to a white neighborhood eight blocks away because the ice cream truck never drove past our house. The day we realized you were taller than me. And now you're, you're going to be murdered for fighting against these greedy, domineering motherfuckers. 
David. Where are you? How much time do you have left? All right, so now I can use the telescope because I already I, saw. I can't stop them, but I have to do something. Mm. So you hear her go through a lot of stages there. So you've heard the anger earlier, right? Um, and now she's like really sad. She like uh, she, she like recounts this bonding ex experience of knowing that ice cream trucks won't come to the black neighborhoods in Baltimore, which is where she's from. So going to the white neighborhoods just to get ice cream and their kids, you know. Um, so just seeing how that racial dynamic affected her. Um, you know, in the, you know, in the 60s um, as like a youth, you know, because if this is like 72, then like she was a kid in the 60s. Um, and, you know, just, just just like going from that and that sadness that like he is going to be murdered and then saying like, I have to do something. So I feel like it really, really captures sort of the, the complexity of the African-American situation um, in this year and this time. Um, and you often think of these characters that are compared to Angel Davis as these like, you know, super war minded people that didn't care about emotion and just wanted to kill all the white people and like do, 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 do all that stuff when it's far from the case. I mean, they are human, too. Um, and I think that Angela Burns shows that really greatly um, in this um, in that Tina. M Tina Marie Murray t t does a great job of amplifying that with her uh, voice. Um, so now let's go to, to the next clip. Where are you, Gabrielle? I cannot endure this alone. There's no point to survival without community, without love. Yeah, so that accentuates it, right? She, she's looking for community and love. I mean, now that, that doesn't necessarily mean sexual love. That just means the love of being part of your community, um, having a group that's down for each other, willing to do what is right, which given the era of, of uh, this game is, you know, ending white supremacy and, and, um, and uh, ending patriarchy and just making sure that, you know, that black people are valued and treated as human beings, basically, um, because we didn't have much in the early 70s, you know. Um, that's after, after King and Kennedy were assassinated and, you know, people kind of gave up on expecting anything, you know, and, you know, a lot of black people said we need to take it for ourselves. Um, so keeping that community and love forefront in her mind, um, I think really helps to humanize not only her, but these black women characters in general, right? Like they're not all just angry and just looking for revenge and like all that stuff. They're human beings. They get sad, get frustrated, get happy, get angry, get um you know all the whole range of emotions i think angela burns does a great job of um really keeping that um first and foremost in the game um so now let's let's go to our last scene which which i really love um check this out <laughs> That was so cool. So it's basically her humming as she's doing these chores. And it doesn't come all through the game, but there's some times where you just keep that hum going. And it really reminds me of growing up and hearing my mom clean. She she would hum and she would sing songs and, and like all that stuff. So, you know, this really, you know, brought back that connection I have with my own mother. Um, and I know that this this is something that is common to African-American households, not exclusively African-American, but it's definitely in there um, of like people singing these songs as they clean, which, you know, obviously ties back to, you know, when people would sing songs while picking cotton and sing songs, you know, um, in like other stressful kind of situations. So it actually comforted me to hear her singing there. Um, you know, so I really, really enjoyed that. And as you see here, you can see a photo of her in the window. Um, and one cool thing is that, you know, it shows her in different outfits. 
Um, and they're all kind of normal, what you'd expect to see a woman wear t- as, as like a housemaid. So there's no crazy bikinis or like, you know, more like Mortal Kombat 9 uh, type uh, uniform. So really, really happy with the representation of how she looks. Even though you don't see her often in the game, you still have a sense that, you know, she's a badass and that she looks the part. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's go to another scene um, that actually shows um, you chilling with some classical music when a uh, very amazing part happens. Check it out. <laughs> Now, up until now, you know, you heard stuff in the background, but never something that close. That noise, especially because I was playing on the headphones, it was really loud. I flew out of my chair because it sounded so close. And as you can see, the flames are really close and they were not that close earlier in the game. So like this really hit home, really frightened me. And just the look of her looking out at the flames as she's cleaning some rich dude's house that claims to be a revolutionary. It just works on so many different levels, and it's a beautiful scene. This, The cinematography of setting this up is just outstanding. Um, once again, Tale of Tales you know, did just an excellent job at portraying a complex black woman with her relationship with uh, war. Um, so let's go to our next clip. As a student in the U.S., I always nodded my head when people talked about peaceful protest. Now I know that it's not always an option. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Kennedy said that just before they killed him. Mm. Now, man, once you drop Kennedy, it's real, right? So, yeah. Kennedy was saying, yo, um, you know, if you, if you can't do peaceful stuff, people are going to get violent. And then people killed him violently, right? So she almost, see, she almost feels like she's being pushed into the option of doing something violent because, you know, like we tried in the 60s. We tried with civil rights. Like we tried with King. We got our, you know, we got the right to vote. We got all this beautiful, beautiful stuff in, in terms of the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act of, of the mid '60s, and all that stuff, but when King was murdered and Kennedy was murdered, you know, it really made it seem like what is this all for, right? So I feel like she really encapsulated that pain in that quote there. Um, all right, y'all. So we're gonna go into the interview with Tina Marie Murray. Um, so this is where I depart, but you will hear me on the interview. But peace when like i saw your name and i heard the voice a little bit i was like i've heard that voice somewhere else oh that's cool yeah and then i found out where i heard it was black august oh cool yes i think that's how they found me i think that's how orion michael found me they stalked me online and 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 found you know they had watched it and and found me online so that was really wonderful like i couldn't have picked a game more in tune with, you know, theater work that I've done and some little bit of consciousness and politics. And it was really, I was really happy that they, that they picked me and tracked me down. We had emails back and forth and Mm -hmm. it was just a great project. You know, this is just kind of unprecedented, really. Their game Mm -hmm. and a black female sort of narrator for it and a political vent, even though it's a fictional world, you know, and, and there's the housekeeper kind of, they've said it in that world. We had lots of political discussions about using, you know, Angela Davis and who she was using her as inspiration. And they, um, you know, I had a lot of input just in talking to them about my fears about it kind of in the beginning. But in the bottom line, I said, you know, it's your project, it's your story, it's what you're doing. I'll Black August and Sunset are two different projects. 
and whatever your story is, I'll, I'll come with it. I'll, I'll give it, you know, I'll give it something and make it work. And I haven't played the game sort of in continuum, but when I recorded the, uh, the script, it was, um, it was in sections. So they then input those sections, which I haven't gotten through all of them. Just the sound designer and I, she sort of walked me through the game and showed me, you know, how it works and when the narration sections come on. So it was kind of easier for me to just, um, to just have the script all there in one piece and someone listening to me on the other end, try to get through a continuity of a story, how that plays out in the game. I, I don't know because I, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, different levels. It's lots of going back and forth up and down the elevator, but what, yeah. what they've done, you know, with, with the backstory of it, I think is, is, is amazing. And that I was really proud to be a part of and the art, the artwork, what they do is, is beautiful. I was really honored to be able to work with them and just, it was a real collaboration. And and that's great. That's great. Awesome. That's what I love about it. Yeah. So, so I'm 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 really curious to hear more about. So you talked about the background and the political discussions and like that kind of stuff. So how how did that kind of you know al um, either alter or add to your approach to the character? Because I'm assuming that once you sort of you know that you came into the. Um, into the role with a certain mind state of what it was going to be. So like, did those discussions um, kind of change that or like add to that or um, anything You're still kind of like working that? In the dark because they're building and they've got a script they're working with and you're in separate places and they really are collaborative. So the woman who is the sound designer, Chris Force, she, I worked at her studio in um, Half Moon Bay Pacifica and she directed me. So it was really great to have someone there. Otherwise, you can, it tends to come off as like reading. It's, and you know, they commented on that. It's, it's hard to pick it up off the, the page with action unless the action's really happening. You know, like, you know, this being independent, they weren't sure how far they were going to go with the character stepping into the game. So they hired someone. She did, um, she did the uh, reflections and kind of so that you could feel as you were moving through that you were, you know, playing this character, this woman, Angela. And, uh, and that's really effective rather than just having a voice and you're moving through and you don't know who you are. So you Afro and you, know, you kind of got to comb your Afro out before you play this game and go, yeah, here I go. I'm the housekeeper. Yeah. Now, um, as far as like the uh, question about channeling specific memories and like, I guess this would also go into the, um, the, uh, Angela Davis role th th that you played as well. Like, how do you get into the zone for these characters that are in like a specific time frame? Um, very important to, um, black history and you, you know, just, just like, like, uh, do, do you think about things in your life? Do you think about things that you might've yeah talk to your family about or reading or research or like a right. combination well, of all story, of that. It was, um, you know, she's, uh, she's an exile, you know, out of, outside of her country and having done, um, the Angela Davis role, I read her by autobiography and she spent a certain amount of time studying in Germany outside of the country. And it's just trying to imagine, you know, what it would be like in a situation where you're, you're in exile, you're, you're, you know, you're not living in your, in your home country, you're dealing with war in another country and you're, you're reserved, you're, um, you're protected from it inside of, you know, sort of what you're doing, but you kind of go deeper and deeper into the story with, with the reactions of, of, you know, who the other characters are. We didn't all play together. There was no conversation or dialogue written back and forth with each other. It was just, uh, it was just the narration, so narrative sections. And I think that's what the user is experiencing is, you know, inside of their house, watching this mm -hmm. war go on outside and, and the possibilities of, you know, what, how they can act and interact with um, the other characters 
And I don't really know how that happens. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you can tell me more because you are just left with the script and, you know, without interacting with the other characters, you don't, you don't know how it's coming. You don't, you don't know how you're supposed to be emotional or non-emotional or so they just directed me to do it two ways i gave them sort of two takes of sort of a straight and then and then it was in the writing who, whoever the writer is it's a it's a mystery writer so far um as an actor that's where you get your stuff it's all in the writing and there were really sort of you know dramatic parts where her relationship with her brother that were easier to get into because of the way they were written and easier to have a reaction about them. And I had, you know, really a lot of help with the sound designer who was directing me and listening and responding to it. I just tried to go there through what was on the page. And she helped me by saying, yes, that's it, or go a little more or do that. And we had some rum, a little... <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little <laughs> that always help helps sort of loosen us up a little bit to to deal with it because you're <laughs> you know you're it's a dramatic story really and um you know it's it's i don't i've never been in a war zone thank god mm. i've never experienced mm. you know blasts and bullets and things going off outside so you know and there aren't there weren't the sounds there until after the game's made so I'm just having to go on what what is on the page. And the writer did a really good job. Great. Great. Now now you you mentioned like the relationship with David, like the character's brother in the game. Um now did you, you know, to sort of really get into the zone for that, did like you have to draw on maybe a relationship that you have with someone or or you know, to like to like really kind of push through that emotion that you showed as a character well, because good. it was really that's effective. That's good to know. It's good to um, hear. Well, I have, absolutely. you know, I have family and, and you just think about, you know, being isolated and in, in an area without your family and your family involved or directly involved in the war. You know, I have a niece in the Peace Corps who went through terrible floods. I have another niece in Texas who, who went through those floods. I mean, those are the kind of things that I've had happen that, you know, where you just worry and you're, and you're, I think the, the political mystery where like falling in love with him or having the romantic side of the relationship was a little bit difficult because it's, it's just the words on the page. So there's no, there's no other character who you're interacting with. We, you know, if, if there was, we probably would have done it like this, a Skype session where mm -hmm. you get to see facial features and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get to really react to someone and what they're, what they are, um, you know, emoting versus having to just come up with it all on your own. But um, Chris was a great director. She was really helpful. And, and Michael always sent some, um, he sent some directions beforehand just to kind of help, help us get into it. Um, as a professional, as a professional voice actor, I was wondering if, like, you've run into any any roadblocks being a black woman in the industry in terms of getting roles or perceptions or, like, feeling like you're being, like, pigeonholed into sp specific things or uh, anything like that. Well, with my voice, you know, I've done a lot of e-learning. And the other sort of character roles I've done have been mostly... Um, Oh, it's been a myriad of projects. You just kind of take what comes along and I haven't let it stop me. You know, this, this was just like a dream come true in terms of it being a black female character and someone relatable in a lot of ways to just my own experience and things that I know in the world. Um, I've done, I've done all sorts of characters, you know, superheroes, Oprah, um, some voice matching, you know, those are the kinds of things that are out there. So you have to have a lot of stuff in your wheelhouse just to go for it. I mean, voiceover is one of those arenas where it's, there's a lot of stars in it. And the stars are what sort of the people, you know, the powers that be that are hiring you know and resonate with. 
So they'll refer to sound like Morgan Freeman, sound like uh, mm -hmm. Alice and Janney, sound like, you know, and they're not really usually bringing up, uh, you know, sound like Queen Latifah, sound like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just all the, all the different black female stars that are out there that are current. Sometimes though, sometimes that's what they refer to. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you can pigeonhole yourself. You can like, let that be annoying, but if you really want to do the work, you just, you just do it. You just use your voice and you just come up with, with whatever it is they're looking for. And you, you sell them you. Okay, so great. That's, that's the challenge and it's out there, but it's out there always in acting. It's just kind of the nature of the game. And okay. it's fun and you, it's fun work. It's great work. And you just have to kind of keep pounding the doors down and, and you know, yeah, using, so. using your skills and all everything in your wheelhouse to, to get it and not let anything stop you. No, I, I, I really like that selling you point because I think often we hear that when, um, you know, when uh, companies are hiring, um, whether it's a voice actor or like a regular actor, they usually have a perception of what that character like should be in mind. Right. And, and if somebody comes in that might not look the part, they automatically like dismiss them, even if, you know, they could, they could deliver the, um, you know, like the voice and, and, and the intonations of that character fine. Um, and I've heard that a lot with, you know, with uh, people of a color that they go in for, uh, for our roles that don't say POC on the sheet. And they're automatically kind of dismissed because, like, they just don't believe that they can do a uh, non-ethnic role, you know? Yeah, the one good thing, I mean, it, it kind of goes both ways. Um, you know, when you throw out that what is ethnic and, uh, I mean, we've got the Rach Rachel, whatever her last Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, that is that's, a madhouse. Yeah, we've got that whole thing on the table right now, which is just brings up all sorts of things, but that's image more than voice. But it does translate to voice, you know? What does black sound like? You know, right. we sound like everything. And, you know, there's there's vernacular, there's, there's you know, speaking in your own patois, whatever you want to call it. And there's characters, I guess, that are written like that. So I suppose you have to be able to, to pull that off and you can do it. There's challenges in casting because casting just can be limited sometimes. And you've got to go in with your energy and your spunk and, and, and talk, them into, talk them into you, that you're the one to work with, that you can give them what they want. And um, that opens doors, I think. We went really back and forth a lot on this one because they were trying to direct me. Um, Michael was trying to direct me from Belgium. And all it was was the character. And because I had done Angela Davis on film and I felt this character was being modeled after her, I kind of got into that whole conversation with him. And he was really cool. He, he received it. He was able to listen to it. He was like, look, we've decided you're the one we want to work with. So... Um, it can be hard for directors to direct actors. So, you know, you just have to get to the point where you, you've talked them into you're it, you're the one. It's really nice when you can use your natural voice, but a lot of time you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're putting on, you know, putting something over it, channeling it, being something different, a Disney princess or you know, right, higher yeah. voice to be younger or a British accent, which I end up using a lot and a lot of African accents sometimes just, uh, which are like, really, it's fun to be able to use those things and, and pull them out. Is there a native African that, that they could find to do it? Sure, they could. But you're in there, you're in the game. It's part of the work you do. And it's nice to, uh, it's nice to be able to flex that muscle when you get the chance. Okay, great. Now, um, do you see that, um, I'm assuming that like you, you probably have a huge network of other voice actors and actresses and everything. Um, do you see that video game voice acting, is it taken as seriously within the industry as other forms of voice acting? I think work is work. And 
as an actor, you, you want to be working. That's what you want to do. I mean, I'm out in the Bay Area, so there's EA and there's, um, I think Blizzard might have an office up here. There's a lot of the yes. companies that have, have offices around. There's Leapfrog. They do toy voices. Um, there's a lot of players up here. And, you know, it, it's it's a bit lower paid than television or uh, film, certainly, but it's it's fun and it's good people. It's a good good group of people to to be with and work with when you get the chance to. And I've done some audio digital replacement work out at uh, Skywalker. I was working on Minority mm-hmm. Report and um, uh, uh, AI. So you know, with a looping group and. So it's just really fun to get a chance to do all all kinds of things that you can possibly do. You know, the more you get to do, the the more opportunities you see there are in the field. And um, I think games like this, you know, definitely take it seriously because it's geared toward a narrative. It may not have shown up, like, continually in the game, but... Um, you know, it they use they use the narrative for their purpose to tell their their story in the way they wanted the the user to have their experience. So I would love to see you know more narrative type scenarios go go on in games. And uh, you know, for me, it was just an awesome opportunity. Thank you so much again. Oh, I hope that uh, we can talk soon and i hope to hear you in more games i really do hey there you go this is a good start